Now on one occasion, there were some present who reported to Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And he said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower fell in Siloam and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Then Jesus began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. single young women out there and uh, think carefully if you fall in love with the priest and want to marry him because if you do you should never bear children on Sunday <laughs> a priest is celibate even if he's married on Sunday <laughs> of suffering. Why do we live in a world of suffering? Why is there so much pain that abounds around me? And why is it that I myself oftentimes experience moments and sometimes moments that stretch into years of great anguish and pain and suffering? 
And then we have the skeptic who will say to us who are striving to live a life of faith, if there is a God and he is so good, why does he allow so much suffering? I would rather not believe in such a God that would permit such horrendous suffering that we have witnessed in this world. How many have heard that question? <clears throat> and it's a question that is never fully answered to our satisfaction. It is a question that is posed to us today in these readings. It is a question that is posed by some of the followers to G of Jesus to Jesus himself. And he responds. And at first it may seem that Jesus is responding in a way that is not helpful. That in a way that's not useful. Jesus doesn't come back with a snappy, e easy answer. And so we are confronted with the reality of the mystery of suffering that we experience in our lives. And as I look at my life and I look back at my past, I have memories of past wounds and past difficulties. And they have formed me, and I carry them with me. I try to be free of those things so that I can be free to engage in the moment, in the now. And as I look to the future, and I look at it with any kind of honesty and realism, I realize that the older I get, the more prone to suffering I will become. And ultimately, I will confront that great and fearful, terrifying reality of my death. But when I observe others around me who have died, I realize that oftentimes, long before the day of death arrives, I may enter into a great period of time of enormous pain and suffering, and I'm filled with a kind of dread. So I'd rather not think about these things. And I know that you come to church sometimes to get an inspiring message to feel better, but I'm not making you feel very good right now, right? <laughs> but we have to embrace the truth and the reality of our life situation if we're able to speak any words of comfort or hope. If we do not fully grasp or are willing to confront the reality of the human predicament, the reality of our own suffering and the suffering of others, we will not be able to receive a gift that God offers us, and that is the gift of hope. The first reading today is a familiar story, and if you come to Bible study in the midweek, you would recognize that study because it's from the book of Exodus. It's the study, or it's the uh, story of the calling of Moses. And you're familiar with this story. It's an archetype of a story. It is a story that has been told again and again and is very familiar. Moses grew up in the splendor of the Egyptian civilization. He was a prince of Egypt, and he grew up with all the privilege and the luxury that comes with having such a position in life. But that would all change for Moses one day, and he would be forced into exile. He would be a man without a country. He has fallen from the great heights of human privilege, and now he finds himself living a life of a nobody in the desert. In his exile, he crossed into the deserts of Arabia, and there he met a woman by the name of Sephora and her sisters. And they introduced him to Jethro, an Arabian priest. And there Jethro welcomed Moses into his home. Moses was a great Egyptian with all kinds of wealth, but now he had nothing to offer. And this kind man, Jethro, gave Moses a new identity. He gave him his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. And so Moses would no longer be Moses, the stranger in a strange land, but Moses would be the son-in-law of the priest of Midian. It's not quite the same as being the prince of Egypt, but it's certainly better than being nobody. And that, for all practical purposes, was the end of the story of Moses. That was all his life was going to be, and he resigned himself to his lot and was going to live out the rest of his days watching sheep that belonged to another man. 
living in his household, living off his kindness. One day when Moses was all by himself, out in the desert watching over the flocks, he saw a strange sight. And this burning bush started talking to him. Now, he must have been out in the desert a long time, some of you may think. But he was there, and he saw an unusual sight, and he says in that quaint biblical narrative, I must go over and investigate this strange thing. And so he does. And he sees a bush with an unearthly fire glowing about it, and yet it was not consumed. It was a heavenly fire. And out of this bush, a voice spoke. And the voice of God spoke, and the first words of this God who was unknown is the name of Moses. He calls out, Moses, Moses. And of course, like a good Middle Eastern man, Moses responds in the typical way, here I am. That's all you see, that's all you'll get. Here I am. And the voice said, remove your shoes. For the ground you are standing upon is holy. <laughs> and so Moses removed the shoes off his feet because he was standing on sacred <laughs> soil. My brothers and sisters are brothers and sisters of the Islamic faith. To this day, before they enter into a synagogue, will remove a synagogue, I mean a mosque. Get my world religion straight. <laughs> they remove their shoes. I noticed this when I visited the Blue Mosque. Uh, in Istanbul. I had to remove my shoes before I went in. They still practice that because it's sacred ground. My brothers and sisters, the ground that you're standing on now is no less sacred. We consecrated this place to be a house of prayer and worship of the Almighty God. This is holy ground. But in our Western sophisticated culture, we do not remove our shoes, nor do we require that. If you were to remove your shoes now, we would have to burn the incense, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Buddha, a man of another religion, went to meditate under the Bodhi tree, we are told. And I can't remember his civilian name. What was it, Tony? Gautama. Gautam. Gautam. Uh, Buddha is not his name. Just like Jesus, his name is not Christ. That's a title. And one day, as Buddha was under the Bodhi tree, something happened. We are told by the Buddha that he woke up. He became enlightened. In fact, the word Buddha, the title means one who's awake. It was as if all of his life in the midst of this world, he was only sleeping. It was all like a dream, but now he saw things as they really are. He confronted the reality of the human predicament. And what did the Buddha say about what he saw and what he awoke to? This truth, that all is suffering. All is suffering. Isn't that interesting? And I think that when we wake up, we realize that that's the truth of our predicament. Suffering is all around us. But why? Moses, when he encountered God in the burning bush, who called out to him by his name, identified himself as the God of your ancestors. That's who I am, Moses. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You might have forgotten about me. You haven't heard from me in a long time. In fact, I've been silent for the last 400 years. But I have heard the cries of my people in their affliction. I am intimately acquainted with their suffering. And I have heard their cries. And now the time has come. The waiting is over. And I will act to deliver my people. And then follows a very interesting discussion between God and Moses. As Moses tries to talk God out of sending him to Egypt. But you know how it is when you try to talk God out of something. You know, there's an expression, don't try to arm wrestle with God, you won't win. And that's the story of Moses. And what this tells us is not the answer to the question, why is there suffering? But this story tells us that the God we worship is aware 
of our suffering. My brother or sister, God is aware of your pain. He knows your suffering. You are not alone in that suffering. God has never abandoned you. In fact, God is so intimately close to you within the depths of your heart in this time of pain and anguish that you may be experiencing, whatever it may be, that he shares in your suffering. God is a God who suffers with us. God is the suffering God. And this is a great mystery. Religious people like to come up with nice pat answers. Simple answers to difficult and profound questions. And oftentimes when religious leaders are asked the question, you know, why is there so much suffering in the world if God is so good? And the religious response to that is typically this. You've heard it before. Well, if that person's suffering, they probably deserve it. Right? You must have done something wrong. You must have committed some abominable act, and that's why this tsunami took your house away. You must have been bad in some way. You must have forgotten to go to Mass one Sunday, and that's why you're in this car wreck. Why do I know this answer is so readily uh, accepted by us? Because the moment something bad befalls you, what's the first thing out of your mouth? It's a prayer. It's like this. It goes like this. You know this prayer. You've said it before. Why me? What did I do to deserve this? That's an inadequate answer. It's only partially true. Because in the world, there are two kinds of suffering. Jesus illustrates that in the gospel today because he is asked this question. Some followers of her, his approached him on this day and they said, you know, what about those Galileans who were taking their sacrifices up to the temple in Jerusalem? They were minding their own business. They were just going to go up there to pray and worship God. Why is it that they get caught in this riot and the soldiers of Pilate, the Roman governor, comes in and slaughters them and kills them so that their blood is mixed with the blood of their sacrifices? Why did such a horrible thing fall upon them? Is it because somehow they were more evil or sinful than the rest of us who were spared that event? Jesus says, no. There is a kind of suffering, and it's the 90% of the suffering we experience in the world, that is not in any way connected to human behavior. We live in a world of suffering. It is the condition of the universe at this time. It is the human condition. There is suffering that happens, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. It just happens to us. Bad things happen to good people. Jesus said, do you think those people were any more, uh, any more sinful than anyone else? No, they had nothing to do with it. It's the fact that suffering is all pervasive and most of it has nothing to do with human conduct. But then Jesus goes on to say something that seems almost contradictory. But you will have the same thing happen to you if you do not repent, change your mind. So there is a suffering that we create for ourselves. We inflict our own suffering because when we make bad choices, we have to pay the consequences of those bad choices, and oftentimes it leads to suffering. There is that reality. It's not God inflicting some kind of punishment on you. It's just a fact that when you do X and Y, you will get Z. Z. Okay, that works. I, 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 I'm not very good at algebra. But, but the thing is, is that there are certain things. And when someone does something bad and something bad happens to them, I don't feel much pity for that person. Really, to be honest with you. I was watching the History Channel, which I often do, and I would, it was like the fifth time I watched the same program, uh, The Last Days of the Third Reich. And there's Adolf Hitler with his, uh, uh, his uh, last few followers with him in the bunker as Soviet bombs were falling upon them everywhere, obliter obliterating the city of Berlin. And it's a pathetic story. Hitler is suffering. 
He is in great pain. But I do not feel much sorrow for Hitler or his lieutenants because they brought it on themselves. And the horrible things that would happen to them was self-inflicted by a life devoted to the pursuit of hatred and murder and injustice. And so they got their just desserts, we say. But that is one kind of suffering. And when we are experiencing suffering that's a direct result of our bad decisions, we need the mercy of God. And God is forgiving. God is gracious. God wishes no one to perish. But there will be things that will be happening to us that have nothing to do with our behavior. It's the fact that we live in a world of suffering and pain. But we are not a people without hope. Why? Because God, like the people of Israel in their slavery and affliction, He hears your prayer. He knows your suffering. He's acquainted with your loss and grief. And God will do something to deliver you from your suffering, but not in the way that you think. Not in the way we think. Not just magically wishing it away. No. God will transform your suffering into blessing. That which was a curse will become your blessing. It's called redemptive suffering. And God will suffer with us and we will suffer with God until the fullness of time, and it may take a long time, when God will act decisively and all things will be transformed, even the universe itself, because God has appointed us for a great destiny. And we look ahead beyond the suffering and death of old age. We look beyond the horizon of death and we see a new world coming, my brothers and sisters. Your pain is not hopeless. The night is dark and long, but the dawn is coming and there will be a new day. And we are invited to be a part of that new day. And if we put our trust, if we change our minds about the human condition and realize that God in an invisible, hidden way is already at work, to deliver his beloved humanity, to deliver you, to deliver me from this dilemma of death and pain and suffering. It's going to happen. That is what Jesus is telling us. And we are called to put our trust and faith in God, knowing that God will deliver us, deliver all of humanity, just as he delivered his people from the bondage and suffering and pain of Egypt. God will deliver you. It may take a little bit more time, but while you're waiting for that great deliverance, know that you're not alone. That God is with you. And He feels your pain. And He is suffering with you. And the day of deliverance draws nigh. The day will come when God is, will say, I hear your cry. I hear your voice. I hear your call. And I'm now going to act. And I'm going to take your suffering and transform it into the very means by which you will be redeemed, glorified, made whole, and filled with abundant joy. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we pray.